Hello. So I wanted to make this video and it's going to be potentially the hardest video I've had to make actually because what I want to talk about is going to be extremely, everything I talk about is close to home. There is no like, there's no like, well not, yeah everything, everything I ever talk about is very close to home. There's no getting around that because I share things from my life, things from observations around me and Mostly, I just share my journey and like the things which, well, yeah, in these kind of chats, mostly I just share the things I've done to help heal myself. When healing's like an ongoing process, it never just stops. Anyhow, it's really early, it's like about half, well, 7.57, sorry now, 7.57 on the 23rd, the 10th. So I've been 38 for a month, whoop, whoop. <laughs> um, I feel really awkward though, and I don't like the camera angle very much. I feel like I need to immediately stop and move everything, but I'm not going to do that because um, I think where I just have a do you know what actually I will do it. I'll move it over here. I'll leave it rolling because I can always I can always chop this bit out. I'm just going to leave it rolling purely because I've just got one of those feelings that if I switch the camera off or try too hard getting a nice like filming angle. It feels, see that's worse, the light's worse now. <laughs> I feel like as though things are going to start happening is trying to distract this video from, from happening, right? So if things like the light are a bit rubbish, then we'll handle that. We can deal with that. I'll just put the top light on as well. And then hopefully we can counter things. We can counter things by adding lots of false lights all around us. <laughs> I said that because I couldn't help the student irony in the fact that I'm struggling as I have light shining on me when I know full well that there's most things that I talk about there's a lot of dark sides which I'd rather I didn't speak about it this is my last attempt to uh... oh that's trippy as I don't like that either <laughs> why am I allowing myself to get distracted like this come on Nina Sort it out, missus. My light bulb. My light shade is broken on that light. When I was young, there's no way I would have used the light with a lamp, broken lampshade like that. I'd have thought it was like well scratchy. Because it is, look, it looks awful. I only have it on at night time and only I see it. <laughs> and I've got nice, you know, it's just a, it's a light I don't particularly like. Anyhow, I don't don't feel the need to defend my lack of shade but I do I do find it funny to look at because I know full well that when I was younger I wouldn't have ever used that I'd have been like you know a lampshade Nina right I'm gonna try and switch that one off and then we'll try and get back to where we started and you know I could happily run around messing around with the lights <laughs> it probably would be preferable to talking about what I'm gonna talk about and then people could think oh why are you gonna talk about it Nina I want to talk about like, right, okay, hurt people hurt themselves. That's what I've been hearing over and over for a while now. I mean, it's not a surprise. It's not like as though you wake up one day and think, yeah, hurt people hurt themselves. Hurt other people, sorry. Not just themselves, they hurt other people. And I've, I've known this for years, hence why for years I've been spitting everywhere nice <laughs> hence why for years I've been on my own not because like some people think that I'm on my own because I've given up on love oh god that couldn't be more true when I split when my ex and I split up I said at the time I'll never compromise for love again now at the time that shocked me a little bit purely because I you should never compromise for love in the first place um, but I don't really, it's, I feel like now it sounds really weak and pathetic if I say I was programmed to be with my ex and I couldn't, I couldn't break the program, I didn't know what to do. And then, um, I was friends with him already and so I did grow to love him. I was never in love with him and that's what saved me I think because this man is now up on, in Crown Court in December for, for raping his wife. I mean, the whole thing with his wife has just been horrific. I feel like I've been through hell with this relationship because whenever things would go wrong, he, 
he'd get in touch and want me to counsel him and try and like make things better and because I felt a sense of responsibility and I did care you know I really was worried about her and I really was worried about them both equally actually because and I wrote them both a letter which I now think of as a legendary letter because I, I did it and not long after they got married, after he'd rung the police with a hammer in his hand and told them if he didn't come in and arrest him, he was going to kill his wife, okay? That's the first time that my ex got in touch with me after they got married. And so it was already chaotic, of course, you know? He had just been arrested for bringing the police and telling him he was going to kill his wife. And so it's been very intense and I wrote a letter to them both which I sent to them on every like avenue I could find of social media because um be because I was I knew if, I knew if he saw it first he probably would want to delete it you know it was a very revealing letter very honest I don't mean I wrote a letter and I was like a cow to them not at all that isn't me at all you know I'll try and help people from back from hell. I always have tried to help people back from hell. Um, anyway, unfortunate. well, I could say unfortunately it didn't work because now he's up in Crown Court for rape charges, but it has worked from the point of view that they're still both alive. And when I wrote that letter, which I kind of feel a little bit tempted to read out on a video at some point in time, but I won't. It's very personal to them and it's very unfair for me to do such a thing. Um, I don't need to, anyhow. It's just fascinating to see, unfortunately, how everything I wrote happened, except for the fact that it's still worth a light. That's the only thing that hasn't come to pass, and I pray to God. I don't think it will now. I really genuinely believe that... I believe them. I believe that they really won't get back in touch. I don't know, to be honest. Um, I, I think it's gone too far. I think they finally both... Would pro yeah, I think it's okay now, but it's not okay because I really uh, know full well that if he doesn't get sent down for this, he will rape or kill someone next. And it just sickens me to the stomach knowing that that was who I was with and knowing that's what he's become. Uh, I wanted to make this video, actually I wanted to make this video about um, control mechanisms which are used to keep people controlled, under control. And um, he was definitely used to keep me under control. Uh, my first like relationship was used to both control, it was used to divide and conquer me really, from the point of view that I was madly in love with somebody who on one hand was everything that I thought I wanted to be, meaning very, seemed very spiritually in touch, rubbish at the physical stuff, but I was good at the physical stuff then, I was only 20, and so I was really good at all the physical stuff, and wanted to be ace at all the spiritual stuff. Now looking back, I was already spiritually in tune, I had nothing to worry about, but I was very misunderstood, and she, she understood me. Um, probably far too well. <laughs> she was 10 years older than me as well. Hey, yep, that was a bit trippy. Um, I don't like that. I don't like the edges, they've gone very weird. Should I try doing that again to see if it like, makes any difference? <laughs> I suddenly feel really uncomfortable. And it's really hard to stay on point. Yeah, she, um, my hair looks really short as well. I don't like that. That's, this is my hair when it's really curly. And it's kind of like amusing that I've got my hair like this and just got it so curly and it's like there's nothing there. Before this would have been like one side of my hair. One side of my hair, if it was down and curly, would probably be about out here. That's probably a fair assessment. If you had a bit if you imagine a bit more on top, I mean like you know where it's a bit sparse. And then it would have been like that both sides. And I would have been like, oh my god, I've got so much hair, which I have I've got so much hair. Um, and before I wouldn't have wanted it to be all thick because it would have like started to bug me and now I'm like oh my hair's so thin please go thick and I have to do stuff like that which I've never done in my life before because if I had a shape put my head upside down and gone like that before my hair would have been out here <laughs> just a big afro
afro. And I never wanted it to do that. It's actually annoying if your hair does that. And it looks silly. Anyway, I'm trying to just let it be its natural curl now all the time, which is quite hard for me to do because I miss the length having it curly. But at the moment, even though I only used to blow dry it once a week, I think even that's too much. And for your hair to be in peak condition, you need no heat on it at all. And so seeing as I haven't got very much hair left, I'm thinking, let the hair that's left get peak condition. <laughs> you know, what better defense mechanism than being as God intended us to be? And so then you can say, well, why have you got eyeliner on, Nina? You're absolutely right. I use coal eyeliner. I like it. That's why I got it on. I've got coal eyeliner on because I like it. But I don't always wear it, you know. Um, for years, I didn't wear any makeup ever at all. I just went to work and came home, went to work and came home, went to work and came home. And because I worked on a stable yard, riding horses, funnily enough, makeup isn't required. <laughs> to be fair to my ex, he did used to say one thing to me, which helped me. And that was, Nina, you don't have anything to make up. And it helped me because my mother had like ingrained into me that I had everything to make up. And she did that from the second I went through puberty. And so I actually had no, no security. And so the thing with people like my ex is, there's always the hook to keep us there. And then there's always the opposite side of that. But in any like kind of abusive relationships, the control grid behind before the abuse really starts, which is actually now in my eyes the, the worst abuse, is all the psycho. It's always been in my eyes the psycholo psychology behind the abuse and the psychological effect of the abuse is is in my pro point in is in my mind's eye the um, worst part because it's invisible. Nobody but the two involved know what's going on and because it's so invisible the one who's receiving it doesn't really know it's happening and you know it could well be sometimes I, I don't know I've always been a little bit on the fence about this because it could be sometimes that the perps don't even fully realize what they're doing it's just that in my experience they know what they're doing if somebody can think to rewrite their history as soon as the heat hits them they know what they were doing even with the psychology, because my ex now, if I spoke to him now, he would deny everything. He tried calling me because he wanted me to, this is, cracks me up. My ex, who ruined my whole entire 20s, on one hand, did. On the other hand, I stayed alive through my 20s. So whilst I, it's taken me till 38 to really get over a lot of the stuff which happened, and in many ways, I still am getting over it. And I probably will do for another 10 years. I don't mean the loss of my ex. That was like, oh my God, that was the best thing that could ever have happened. Um, of course, at the time, it felt, it felt horrible. But, it's, but no, I also knew at the time it had to happen. Um, but the conditioning was so like firmly in place. And it's programming. It's programming, simple as. Um, and it had been put in place for years before I was even triggered to be with him. Oh, it was so intense that night where being to the Blair Witch Project, which now it's just like so cringy, that's what we've even gone to see. It was rubbish, by the way. <laughs> and then pecked him on the lips and everything stopped and realigned. Time stopped and realigned. And I knew in that moment, in that heartbeat and time, I knew that I was going to end up with him and there was nothing I could do about it. Whereas now I know a lot about programming and I know what happened there now. But back then I didn't. And then they like do things to you, like you become homeless. Um, there's loads of things they can do to push you into the arms of, push you into the center of the den, to push you into the central point of danger. But with it cloaked as uh, safety, you know? And with it cloaked as though you've got more control and stuff than what you really have. Anyway, yeah, my ex got in touch with me the other day. He wanted me to write him a statement. He wanted me to write him a, a character statement or some kind of thing. Because I am his only, like, long-term, proper relationship, really. Um, I mean, we were together about eight, nine years. All of my 20s were gone. I was 22 when, I got, when we got together. By 23, 
by 23 I had been indoctrinated to what became the next 10 years really being heroin that's really how they managed to shut me up and keep me alive they gave me a, a huge heroin addiction which meant that I was working multi jobs each day because my ex didn't work and he was on it too but interestingly only between 10 and 20 pounds of a day so he wasn't really doing that much I was at one point in time I had to say a hundred pounds of a day and people could think well was she off her head the whole time well now I'd say yes I was but at the time no I wasn't I was taking it to lit I was taking it to I was taking it to be able to survive the pain I was taking it as a painkiller I was taking it to block the life that I couldn't it was basically the perfect perfect extra programming tool on top of the programming layers if you know what I mean because doing something like that it it basically numbs you it keeps you disassociated and um, yet on the other hand in my case it enabled to, me to, to live with the pain because the pain was being numbed so much anyhow that was so that was 10 years before I even as soon as grandpa died I started getting clean I'd already tried to start whilst he was still alive because I'd always said if I'm still on this shit just like that if I'm still on this shit when I'm 30 I've got to get clean because I wanted to have kids and I wouldn't have kids and bring them into even though I was a functioning addict which now just makes I hear myself say that now and I'm like yeah that means you're even more messed up than what most people were <laughs> because most people rightly fall apart on 100 pounds of anything a day I didn't I I just worked a lot and was a controlled a lot and bear in mind I was working with race horses you know that was my main job uh, but it pays rubbish money and I was always very aware of one thing if that was the life that I was going to be stuck in <laughs> stuck in I mean that kind of was but at the time of course I didn't see it like that but I definitely saw this like this very very clearly that I will not be a criminal and be getting worrying about police knocking on my door um 24/7. A, I haven't got um I haven't got it in me to be living a life ducking and diving because because you know that I was very straight up about certain things being the foot point being I don't ever want to feel reliant on someone else which makes me laugh because I was always very reliant on my two exes but I didn't realize that at the time I did with my first one we went on we, we used to drink quite a lot but we were not on drugs together I mean I was never an addict really I did drink too much of her though but I was never an addict to any illegal drugs until I was with my ex and he, ironically I said to him when I was trying to counter the stupid programming that was like trying to get us together I said to him I wouldn't go out with him unless he got clean so he got clean <laughs> and we went to Greece the summer and that was that but then when we came back from Greece and I was like a million percent broken still and he'd done a lot of groundwork like a lot of groundwork this is what I mean about the psychology behind it all and this the conditioning and programming that goes into place to make you to make you feel like you're choosing to do things which in actuality you really were never doing it's kind of like you're out of options and you don't know what else to do and you know you can't run to your family because they'll throw you under the bus and you know you can't run to anyone there's nobody to run to and yet you're so young and confused yourself because you know what the truth is, right? I always knew what the truth was. And so I did. It was a massive painkiller. And actually, much as I look back on it and see how it was all perfect programming to keep me down, I also can look back at it and say, yeah, but I was like running scared and with no one of any safety to run to and too broken to be able to just get my own place and survive that brokenness with Jesus which should be a no-brainer but when you're too broken to even like think to do that that says it all to me anyhow I wanted to make this video about control mechs about um, 
I've mentioned my ex and how hurt people do hurt one another. And the reason why I stand alone now, on my own physically, like there's no, I'm not with anyone. And I don't intend to be with anyone unless I'm a little bit more healed myself, unless the person that I would meet would be equally healed as me. Because I don't want to play someone's savior. Like I used to try and rescue people when I really try, should have been rescuing myself. Um, I don't want to play anyone's, um, yeah. I don't want to be anyone's like rescuer, but I also don't want to put myself onto somebody unless I feel like I'm, you know, a little bit more healed than now. Because let's face it, if you're going to meet the one that you really want to be with and want to stay forever, you don't want to have an inferiority complex, do you? You want to know you are at the best you can be, and how wonderful you can both at the best you can, at the best you can be in that. You're not still a hurt person who has got the potential to hurt him and vice versa. And so that's why I stand on my own whilst I'm doing all the healing. No, I don't stand, ever stand on my own. I always stand with Jesus. But physically, yeah, I do. I stand alone and I'll help people heal too. But I won't go out with somebody just because I think they're a bit all right. You know what I mean? Anyhow, this is getting so long and I really wanted to put it on both channels. So I'm going to have to keep it short, although I might carry on talking and do a part two. Um, I did just want to quickly say, before I go, when I did the basis interviews, I didn't know what to do. I haven't really known what to do for ages about, about that part of my life. It never was meant to be a quote-unquote secret. Um, I, I, nobody who knows me properly doesn't know about my past. I'm very open about it. After I did the basis interviews, which aren't really a very fair representation of me anyhow um i felt like oh god you know now if i come out and say my full truth i'm going to immediately discredit myself because so many people are watching those videos and seeing me as like i don't know someone bonkers um now i don't, it's not like i care what people what people think because i don't but i do i did care to like get to know people a bit and for people to get to know me before I like told everything about my own personal life, past and present, and and not the agendas in play as well, you know. Uh, so yeah, anyone who's known me, even like just people I've met online, I always tell them like my my, my full truth. As soon as I, if I if we chat regularly, they know they know my past because I tell them, um, and obviously everyone in real life does too. And uh, yeah, so there we go. I'll talk more about this, but I'm, running, I'm really out of time now. So thanks for watching and take care. And remember, we can heal all our wounds. We can with Jesus, who's just behind me there. And yeah, I think it's a good little phrase to remember. Hurt people do hurt one another. And so if you're a hurt person and someone's hurting you, then the chances are it's a two-way thing. And maybe we should be a little bit more careful about who or what we do or don't do. And I say that as somebody who's made all the mis mistakes all through my 20s and learned by 32, hurt people hurt one another. And you need to heal yourself before you can expect to be with somebody else. And it ought to be all right. Oh, and just for the record, I haven't been doing drugs for a very long time. You know, I was 32 when I first started getting clean. And for me, that meant I did a lot of cold turkeys because I never saw the uh, worth in drug replacements or they call it drug replacement therapy. I call it drug replacement trauma because it's not really doing anything, actually, if you're replacing it with a drug which is stronger than the drug itself. And also, I had a very... I am going to keep talking now and I'm going to have to edit this into two halves. So I will keep talking now. Um... She says and goes blank. <laughs> I never saw the benefit in taking a drug stronger than heroin itself. Now heroin, look at that. That's trippy ass. <laughs> Just a light on my hair, but I think it's a little bit more than that for a moment. Like we are light at the end of the day. It shines out of us sometimes. Um, I'm surprised it's taken me this long to talk and start going blank. Um, maybe I'll 
I'll stop this and carry on. I'll have to edit this out. This is the kind of thing I would edit out, actually. Um, especially if I'm sat here twiddling my thumbs for much longer. So, how annoying. Getting clean. That's what I was talking about, or trying to. No, whatever I was saying is gone, but what I wanted to just really, like, instill home was that it's a painkiller. It's basically morphine, isn't it? Too poor. I've remembered what I was saying before now. It's a painkiller. So to me, the fact that that drug was in my life was really obvious as to, both from the point of view that if you're doing something like that, you can never plan ahead without doing a lot of planning. Because if you're gonna go away, now I used to go on holiday once a year, and that was, I never took anything away with me. But if I'd have gone away in England, in Britain, I would have taken, I would have taken, I would have taken drugs to use. I would have taken my daily habit, or a little bit less. It depended, it, depend, it would have depended how much money I had. And it's actually really hard as an addict to do stuff like that, because the nature of addiction is, if you were to buy like three times more than normal, you'd probably end up doing three times more than normal. But I did a lot on a, on a normal day. Um, like seriously, a hundred quid was my standard addiction at, back in my early twenties. And that didn't start to go down. It started. It had started organically to go down the closer I got to 30. So just before I started looking after Grandpa, I think I was on 60 quid a day. And then when we started looking after Grandpa, I think I was on like maybe 80. Depended really on the days because a lot happened. And people would think, oh, well, she must have been in a state staggering around. No, this is the point. I wasn't. The only time I'd be in a state would be when the lights were off and everything was done. Or if I had an hour through the day to do nothing, then I need to walk in the room, then I would have been probably on the nod because I was so knackered, I worked so hard. Um, and I'd never got much chance to sleep, I got chances to cat nap. But I know, so if you look at all of the stereotypical cult things, I was on deprived sleep my whole entire 20s, my whole entire 20s. I never, and that was firstly with my first love, as she was at the time, and secondly with my ex, because both of them, not, I'm not saying they did it intentionally, but in both of my relationships with them, I was on deprived sleep. I was on broken sleep and I was on cat napping. They got a lot of sleep though, <laughs> I, I didn't. Um, but it's all standard, isn't it? Standard programming tools, but it really, um, anyway, I wasn't making this to get my violin out, because I don't mean it like that. I mean for people who, people get programmed, people get put through trauma in life, all of us, whether we be like as involved as some of us are or not. Life's got a standard protocol these days and trauma is put out on everyone. It's traumatic to be disconnected from Christ. That's a trauma in itself, a massive trauma in itself. People that want to see a mad separation between overt tra trauma-based mind control and covert trauma-based mind control, I can look back now at my life and see it was overt trauma-based mind control, but at the time, I thought it was all covert. I didn't really know what I was dealing with, but um, I, you know, because we were all so well brought up to front things, well I was and John was. Um, so was she in from what was really going on to what was portrayed. Yeah, she was actually. She was a lot more overt than what we were, but she drank a lot. And so I think that makes people a lot more overt than they otherwise would be. If she hadn't have drunk so much, she'd have been very covert too. And is now. She no longer is like the person she was then. And she's very covert now, yeah. Um, but I just wanted to mention the getting clean thing and how ironically I always knew yeah I did loads of cold turkeys and then in the very end because um, you do you have like a patch where you can do that and then if you're still not better fast enough people start getting like annoyed it's like come on get over it already so after like a year or so of that I went to Greece the summer that was 2009 I'm sure I was in Greece in 2009 the summer of Grandpa died in 2007 or 2008. I feel really, I feel quite iffy now about the years. They died in 2007, 
by 2008 I was proper on a mission to get better I say that because I had no distractions you know not even my ex thank god and then by 2009 I was in Greece the summer and then when I came back from Greece the summer and immediately relapsed I, by that point in time I got to a point where if I did relapse it'd be for a couple of weeks and then I'd get better and that's kind of how it was a lot or, but then, or maybe a month or so but I'd always be on this like continual cycle of relapse and get better relapse and get better and that meant um, by that point in time I had to keep working if I'd relapsed and if I did relapse it wouldn't be very much I mean the years where I took like a hundred pounds of a day just to be normal they, they were they were so long ago, but they were for a long time, they were for most of the 20s. But I couldn't always afford to do that much, I mean, it's a lot of money. And I was buying his drugs as well on top and paying all the bills and everything, it was just crazy. I don't know how I did it. Looking back, there would be days, most days, I would get an hour's cat nap in the afternoon, I'd get home from work at six, started full-time, my, my full-time job, started at seven, got home at six, but I'd have like a couple of hours for lunch in the afternoon, so that's why I'd have my hour lunch break, my proper snooze then, ideally. Then my ex would have run me a bath, I'd come home, jump in the bath, well on a good day he would have done, <laughs> come home, jump in the bath, I'd have to be ready and out of the house again by eight. So that gave me, if there was a bath already run, I could have about an hour and a half. I'm like the queen of getting ready really fast. I've got to go anywhere, I can get ready in like five minutes, or I th always think I can, I think realistically I can get ready in ten minutes. <laughs> I don't mean including the bath, I mean like if I was having a bath it would be 20 minutes probably. Um, but the point is I can get ready really quick because I've had never, I've always had very little time to ever do anything in like that. Or this is what I used to be like, you know. And so, yeah, like that. So I get some sleep then. Then I get back in at two-ish. And I could never sleep then, even though I'd be so knackered. And I'd have to then have like, of course, like these patches of sleep, I'd have to do my drugs as well, and then I'd try and sleep for an hour. And when you've been like a long-term drug addict, it's not always the quickest thing in the world to have what you want to have because your veins drop and it's hard to do that. So it could sometimes take half an hour, an hour just to get it in. Oh, it just makes me feel so sick now. The things which were normal and just part and parcel of life. I can't, it's it's so shocking to me. And it was my life, <laughs> you know? It was so shocking, but it was never in my mind, my life that was going to stay. I always knew, come, come age 30, I'm gonna get clean. I'm not living this forever. I never wanted to live it in the first place. And then when I was 30 and I couldn't because grandpa was still alive and I had this like awful feeling, double barreled off a feeling, because on one hand, I always wanted to get clean whilst he was still alive, because I always thought he'll be proud of me then. Even though this is an unspokenness, because he knew I did, he knew it. I mean, my, I was programmed by my family. I, it wasn't just like these randomers that came along afterwards. Everything was like programmed to happen, and things were, my family were my number one supporters even though they'd say that this is slander and they would never admit that now now that was the reality whether they want to admit it or not doesn't really matter to me because i know what the truth was well, they're not going to admit it to me are they must them are not even still here so it's not going to happen and my mother and i are estranged <laughs> trust me if you had a mother that had done the things my mother had, does and and still tries to do and has done for all of my life you would definitely understand why there comes a point in time where you have to walk away. You have to walk away. You haven't, if you want to stay alive and stay healing, you have to learn to walk away and do it with love. You know, it's not like I walked away in a, in a flurry of like abuse. No, didn't do that at all. Sometimes I wish I had, but no. Great sadness, because it's never nice to have to do such a thing. And actually she chose to walk rather than to do any healing herself. So I didn't even do the walking away, but I just set some boundaries. And, you know, having been brought up by people with like really no boundaries, it's like not very nice for them from their point of view when boundaries, when healthy boundaries start getting put in place. Anyway, I just wanted to spit this one detail out that I'm going to stop this really long video. 
and start trying to edit some sense into it just from the point of view that I do want this to go out on my first channel and I want the full version to go out on my second channel I want it to be half an hour long really so I can do it in two parts and just whack it all into my first channel too anyway you didn't need to know that so that can get edited out maybe no I'm being silly well I'm not being silly someone's gonna have to get edited out because it's five minutes over but I must have spent three minutes messing around with the light and the chair so that can all be what goes um yeah I was always super aware of the fact that even though it's far from ideal to be doing a drug like heroin as a painkiller just to stay alive I was also ultra 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 aware that I did not want to be doing any of the substitutes either because all this, in my mind's eye, a drug as strong as that, which is hard to get off, does not want to be replaced by a stronger drug, which is even harder to get off. The only drug which I would even contemplate taking was dihydrocodeine, which is like, kind of like, it was like an old fashioned drug replacement thing, which they now just prescribe. If you went into hospital and had um, an injury to your back or something like that, DFs, dihydrocodeine, used to be what they prescribed people. That's all changed now, because now they prescribe people tramadol, which are a synthet synthetic morphine, and the strongest drugs to get off that I've yet come across. They are more addictive than any anything I've yet come across. And I see them hand mouth people like Smarties, and they don't tell people. And then you have all of these like standard house people, standard house people, I mean just standard middle-aged people, and the next thing they know, they're highly addicted to this mad drug. Because tramadol, hydrochloride, is, in my eyes, a medical speedball, which is cocaine and morphine together. It's a seriously addictive drug, and they hand them out to people like Smarties. Anyhow, so I was always really ultra aware of the fact that I wouldn't do any of that. But in the end, I did use, to, like, use her dihydrocodeine if I was having to well if not, I never had to do like loads of, like get clean and stuff I just didn't want to be on drugs <laughs> and if I didn't have to get clean I wanted to and so I used to do stuff like um I, yeah I would take those because they're so weak they are no one else no one else on drugs would take them as a replacement it's only me that I know who would because everyone's like oh they're far too weak you can still feel like you can still feel that you detox basically and I'd be like yeah but but they just take the edge off a tiny bit so I can go to work. I know that I can stop taking them overnight and I wouldn't be like, yeah, I'll probably feel sluggish. Might have a bit of an upset stomach. And that'd be it. Like for, you know, like five days later, I'd be absolutely fine. I'd be absolutely fine doing it anyhow and I'd be living a normal life whilst doing it. I just would feel inwardly rubbish <laughs> for a few days. And so that was how I viewed them. And that's why in the end I did, did use those, but no. To me, getting clean was an organic process. I have the will and want there for years, and it wasn't always an organic, organically played out process. It was um, a matter of to start with, I did loads of massively dramatic cold turkeys where I would do nothing. I'd be so ill, but it would always be such an amazing time for growth. It was like you've been asleep, but then you do a cold turkey and you wake up and it's amazing. But then it's like too amazing, too fast. And then you're not used to it and you're not used to feeling good about yourself because anyone who's doing something so abusive is not, does not feel good inside. <laughs> Otherwise you wouldn't be doing it in the first place. That's why I can like recognize the perps in my life, but I can also recognize the fact I was damaged and it's not a blame game. If I'm talking about certain things, it's not ever meant to be a blame game in my eyes. But then at the same time, there's some things which are just morally wrong. And in my, that falls to me, like, morally wrong, giving somebody a drug like heroin in the first place, morally wrong. Um, my mind's going to go blank now on all the other morally wrong things which I could mention, which is probably a good thing, seeing as it would have been connected to my ex. So it's best to just draw a line in the sand. Yeah, you know, some people do some really, really bad things. And it's hard to not play the game, lame game. But I never did play the game, blame game because I just recognised how damaged I was and I could have said no. And I didn't because I thought that I didn't know how damaged I was. I knew I was really damaged but I didn't know that a stupid drug would ever be, uh, be stronger than me. Which it wasn't in the end but it was for a number of years from the point of view that I couldn't just stop doing it. I didn't want to actually in my 20s I didn't want to stop. But I always had said well yeah turn 30 still on this 
I'm still on this shit. I'm going to stop doing it. And I did. I just thought I was doing that so I could have kids. And now I see, thank God, I didn't have kids because it's not fair to keep on the cycles of abuse. And even though I could have had kids and done a great job, the world's a very, very tragic place at the moment. And I'd rather be doing what I'm doing now, trying to help people have the tools to get better whilst I'm getting better too, than to be distracted with children running around my ankles and unable to get myself better or to share things to the world. Anyhow, I'm going to end this now because it is turning quite long. And uh, yeah, please do leave comments and, and I'll answer. Uh, sometimes I want to just do like a questions and answer video. But then sometimes when I ask if anyone's got any questions, they bombard me a little bit with 100 questions at once. If I was going to do a questions and answer video, I'd have to like have like just like oh, one or two questions from each person and then try and answer them in a video. Um, I don't mind at all answering people's questions and comments in the comments, but sometimes I just want to do like a question and answer video. So if anyone's got any questions they want for a video, fire them at me and I'll answer what I can. I'll write them out and I'll answer them like as quickly as I can and as many as I can actually. That would be kind of cool to do. So I'm going to go now. Take care. Bye.